Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this morning. I am Robert Parker Norman and I work here at IDWAL as a Marine Standards Officer. I'll be your host this morning, uh, but before we get started, I'll just go through a little bit of admin. First of all, can I ask that you all remain muted throughout the presentation? And secondly, our panel will welcome any questions that you may have. So if throughout the presentation you do have a question, then please use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll then have an opportunity to answer those questions at the end. Uh, if we do run short of time, I will ensure that all questions are followed up on and I'll circulate the no view after this session. So moving on to the presentation, joining me today on the panel are Stephen Jones of the Seafarers Happiness Index, Captain Eve Vandenborn of the Standard P&I Club, and Tom Herbert, Idwell's Senior Surveyor and Crew Welfare Advocate. So Stephen, if you'd like to give a brief introduction. Yes, hi, um, very happy to be here and uh, thank you for organizing this. Um, Stephen Jones, as Robert says, I'm founder of the Seafarers Happiness Index and work with the Mission to Seafarers on, on delivering this. I'm a former seafarer myself from a very long line of seafarers and um, my career was based on seafaring. The lessons I learned at sea have been the, the kind of foundation of my career and in moving ashore and various roles across the industry, I've always looked to hopefully try and ensure that the voices of seafarers are heard and the issues that face them are considered and we try and find answers to make life at sea better for seafarers. So very pleased to be here. Thank you, Stephen. And Eve, if you'd like to give everyone a brief introduction. Thanks, Robert. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much as well, Robert, for inviting me and for organizing this. Happy to be here. I'm, I am Yves van den Boren. I'm based in the Singapore office for the Standard Club, but I look after the loss prevention for the club uh, globally. I'm an ex-seafarer, similar to so many of, of us here, which puts me really close to the well-being of the seafarers. I've always had um, a really good interest in it. And since I joined the club about 13 years ago, I've, I've tried to really put an emphasis on the well-being. So I'm happy to go through this and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and finally, Tom, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, all. As Rob said, my name is Tom Herbert. I am the Senior Marine Surveyor and Crew Welfare Advocate here at Idwell. <clears throat> Prior to working at Idwell, I myself worked at sea as a deck officer, primarily on oil and gas tankers for seven years. I have now been at Idwell for almost three years and I've been lucky enough to see the company grow into what it is today. And I'm delighted to be on this panel today to discuss a topic that I am passionate about. Thank you. So the question that's brought us all here today is, does seafarer well-being have an impact on the integrity and risk of a vessel? So that, Stephen Jones is going to start us off by setting the scene and giving us an overview on the current situation as reported in the last quarterly index results. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Yes, so seafarer happiness, does it matter? And if it matters, in what way and what can we do about it? The Seafarers Happiness Index has been going for about eight years now. It started as part of a social network for seafarers, and we wanted to find out what was going on, what was having an impact on the lives of those at sea. So we devised 10 standard questions based loosely on what some of you might have come across and know as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's about what we as humans desire and need as we move through our lives, so from the basics of food, oxygen, et cetera, through to the various things that make life better. So we asked ourselves, well, what makes life for seafarers? What are the impacts that have on them? So we came up with 10 standard questions, which run from how happy are you generally through to connectivity, wages, food on board, interactions, workload, welfare that you receive. And, and we've started to try to build a picture of what life at sea feels like from not just the professional issues, but personal ones as well, because lest we always should never forget that seafarers live on the vessel. It's their home as well as their work life. So this is a balance that has to be kind of understood and can't ever be ignored. So we look at the circumstances that seafarers are faced with, the challenges, the positives, and hopefully we're able to share that with the industry. And thankfully thousands of seafarers every year take the time to share their thoughts. Next slide, please, Sue. Um, 
they tell us lots of things. They tell us what they fear, what they hope, what they desire, what they dream, all these wonderful things that seafarers want and need. Um, every quarter, we ask the same questions and the results come back. And as you can see there, that's really the, the curve over the past year or so of the happiness levels throughout COVID. And it matches pretty much well the, the kind of infection rates globally. So it started off, there was a dropping away, then there was some optimism, then it dropped again. And the last most recent quarter we had was the lowest results we've ever had. And every single aspect of the 10 questions was a downward trend. So the next quarter, which we're just about to go and um, analyze, is going to be pivotal. You know, is, is this a downward trajectory or, or is there any signs of hope coming? What seafarers tell us, well, they, they want better connectivity, they want better food, they want shore leave is a massive issue, the fact that so few seafarers are even getting the slightest bit of break away from a vessel. They want wages to reflect what they feel is the work done, and unfortunately, many of us are feeling a cost of living crisis, and that's felt acutely by seafarers as well. They want training that reflects the job that they do, and the talk of future vessels, and all these kind of data-driven analytics. They want to feel trained and part of that. They want entertainment. They want exercise. They want people ashore to understand them. The links between management of shipping companies, owners and managers, how they treat seafarers, how they instruct them, how they deal with them. They want to feel respected by those ashore. And they also want to feel under less pressure from workload, from the, the, the kind of pressure cooker activity sense sometimes on board vessels and, and some of them feel that there's a need to have more people on board the vessel because the workload is frankly getting out of hand so next slide please so we talked to them about happiness how do you feel what is your life like what are the impacts on you now that's great in itself and and you know we're proud of what we do thousands of seafarers as i say but that's not enough. We, we, we need this barometer of sentiment. We, understand, we need to understand how seafarers feel, but we need to do something with that. And this is why it's so great to have the support of the Standard Club and also IDWAL now starting to find answers. So particularly from the IDWAL perspective of looking at the standard of ships, what is the well-being impact on the standard of ship? So we can understand, so we can find what needs to be changed <clears throat> and how. So we can bring about <coughs> excuse, excuse me, the solutions, because otherwise we'll just have problems forever. Next slide, please. So the numbers are vital, and we ask them to mark themselves out of 10 on how they feel. And as you saw in that graph earlier, dodges around the 6 out of 10 mark. What does that mean? Well, we don't really know until seafarers tell us. And this is really one of the most powerful aspects of the happiness index. The numbers are important. And they're the hook which drives debate. They're the thing that allows us to, to mesh with the gears of industry and with Idwal's grading of vessels and starting to understand the impact. But it's the stories from seafarers. It's their well-being. It's how we move this forward, how we talk to seafarers, how we listen to them and what pressures they're going through and how we translate that into moving forward. Next slide, please. So this is obviously just a five minute, just slightly over, whistle stop view of the happiness index. So you know it exists, so you can look to it and find things out. But this wider webinar is about how we bring those things together. The concerns for 2022, they're pretty obvious. War, tensions on board, is COVID coming back again. What are the impacts of that? And then all of a sudden from nowhere, we have something like monkeypox, which you'll understand in Bangladesh, has now stopped seafarers going ashore concerns over that. So this constant, the, rink, the geopolitical wrinkles around the world are felt constantly by seafarers. And we need to listen to the seafarers to understand those, the implications of them, and what we can do about it. So I'm really pleased to be on this webinar, looking forward to lots of questions, and I'll hand you over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. That's a, that's a great insight. Uh, I think it only highlights just how much scope there is for welfare standards to be improved. And how we can all work together together to achieve that. Um, so moving on to Eve, what is the standard PI club's perspective on crew welfare then? Thanks, Robert. And really an interesting introduction from Stephen there, setting out all the issues that that we are currently hearing from 
people on the ground. Um, from the Standard Club side, we've been involved with um, the mission and the CFR Happiness Index for a couple of years now, and really happy to partner together with Edwal for for this year on this. And it is it's interesting to see the feedback coming every quarter from the from the index. I, I had to laugh a little bit um, about well laugh I don't know or maybe cry um, about the monkeypox uh, comment and I I did go earlier into our claims record and had a quick look whether or not we've had any any monkeypox claims um, in in the last couple of months I did find um, a stowaway monkey and I did find a stevedore getting hit by a monkey but I I'm glad that at the moment we we haven't had any monkeypox claims yet. Um, I'm sure it may come at some point, and it really does highlight the issue that seafarers are raising about not being able to go ashore. And it seems in more and more ports now, um, the, the the local authorities will find any reason to try and limit seafarers from going ashore, which is really sad. It is such an important aspect of of. Uh, the seafaring live and I remember when when I was at sea at least in my junior years I was able to go ashore in most ports and and enjoy the local uh, scenery and, and look around now the main question is is the well-being of seafarers affecting the risk on board of ships I think so yes definitely I think there are a lot of factors um, in the well-being that are playing a big role and that are increasing the risk on board if the seafarer is not happy. What are we doing on it uh, from the Standard Club side? We have been involved in well-being for quite some time actually, um, well before the pandemic. In, in 2018, we put our seafarer uh, well-being guide together in which we raised a number of guidance for the fitness of seafarers on how to eat proper food, how to do the social well-being on board and the mental well-being as well. We have uh, published a, num a couple of uh, posters on the same topic. Um, I believe that was in 2019 or 2020, which are really putting out the issues as well and which can be put on board of the, the ships. Now, the pandemic has come, of course, and has put the spotlight on well-being, which is really good. It's one of the, the few positive things that have come out of the, um, the pandemic, and that's it, it has highlighted the issue of well-being on board. And we are seeing more and more companies doing more about well-being on board of ships. I mean, the internet connectivity is one of the items, of course, and more companies now, certainly with VSAT, are providing better connectivity to ships and to crews and it's interesting as well to see that the new mlc changes that are that are going to get approved this month or next month will make it a requirement as well to provide uh, connectivity on board of ships it, it sadly doesn't say that it needs to be free but at least it it will become a requirement to provide internet now talking about internet on on board i i do like to always highlight the flip side of that what we are seeing on board of ships is that crew are just simply disappearing into their cabins because they want to uh, communicate with home. They want to see their baby. They want to know what is happening with their family, which is, of course, very important. And it, it, it helps the well-being of that seafarer, but it comes at a cost to the social cohesion on board of ships. And that is something that I feel um, there needs to be a balance and we ship owners need to find a way to improve that social cohesion on board of ships. If you are able to get a happy crew on board, if they start caring for each other instead of only care for their own part or their own family, they will improve the safety culture on board of ships. And I think that is important that companies are trying, be it a barbecue, be it a, a ping pong tournament, karaoke, uh, different nationalities have different ways of, of uh, gelling together. So I think that is really important that that, that balances um, gaps. Um, one other interesting part that I that I found is the East one recently, I think a couple of days ago, released their new report on social interaction matters. And one of the recommendations coming out of that report, which quite interestingly runs along really well with what is coming out of the, the happiness index, 
And ease one is recommending to put, um, how do they call it, a social ambassador on board of ships, which I think is a good idea, which I actually included in my 2018 well-being guide as well, where I, I put forward the idea of having a mental champion on board of ships. And I think it would be good, similar to you have a, a security officer on board, that you have somebody who looks after the social well-being of the seafarers on board. I'm not sure where I am with my time, but I'll, I'll probably stop Robert and I'll take up more questions later. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Eve. That's uh, it's fascinating to be fair. <clears throat> so, Tom, why is crew welfare so important to Idwal then? Thank you very much, Robert. So to start, I would like to better explain what I mean when I refer to the term crew welfare. It can be broken down into three sections, social, mental and physical. Each section is equally important and all must be considered when attempting to create an assessment of welfare on board a vessel. So why is crew welfare important? I would like to start by sharing a small anecdote. Last summer, I was in the shop looking to buy some cladding and furniture and saw that there was none available. I looked in several other shops, but it's no avail. I then looked online and it was the same situation. Everything was either sold out or not available. I was curious as to why, so I did some brief research, and the cause was something I'm sure everyone here will be well aware of, the grounding of the error given. This caused a series canal to be bought for a short period of time, but enough to ensure a delay in delivery of several summer items to the UK, like garden furniture and even garden gnomes. I believe this is a very good example that highlights the importance that shipping has in the global industry and how reliant we are upon it. But who runs the vessels? We know that they are not autonomous just yet, it is of course the crew. In theory, a happy crew leads to a well-run ship and vice versa. As already mentioned, the internet and social media have become ingrained in modern life, more so since the pandemic, as I'm sure everyone here is now an expert in Zoom meetings and uh, Microsoft team calls. When crew leaves join a ship, they are often leaving that part of their life behind. Not only are they leaving the ability to physically see their loved ones, they can also become isolated from a common way of communicating with friends and family. It is important to be able to bridge this gap and it is by improving crew welfare that we can look to do this. I think it is also important to ask what are the risks of not having appropriate welfare facilities on board? In general, the shipping industry has in the past been reactive rather than proactive. Incidents have historically led to widespread change throughout industry and we should not wait for any potential incident or accident to occur more so when we can see the issue is currently present. So why is this topic important to Idwell? Our internal technical team is comprised of ex seafarers, all of whom have a wide range of experience. As such, they empathize with the challenges seafarers face daily. Our pool of over 350 surveyors who conduct over 3000 inspections a year are on board vessels throughout the world on a daily basis and see firsthand these challenges. In order to better highlight this issue, we are included in various other initiatives, including being a sponsor of the, of the Seafarers Happiness Index, as already mentioned. I myself am an active member of my local Port Welfare Committee based in South Wales. And our Head of Marketing, Sue Henney, is a trustee for the International Seafarers Welfare and Assistance Network, ISWAN. It is important to make clear that we are not discussing this issue, this issue to simply raise awareness. Our aim is to make a difference to the welfare of seafarers. Idwell are in a unique position and we must use our voice to amplify these issues to push for positive and tangible change. This graph shows the suspected link between vessel condition using Idwell data as shown on the left side, indicated by the green line, and the seafarer's happiness score as shown on the right hand side, indicated by the blue line. This data is taken from the last quarter of 2021. As you can see, it is split over five different vessel types, bulkers, containers, tankers, row rows, and offshore. This graph suggests a possible correlation between vessel condition and happiness on board, with correlation being the lower the condition score of the vessel, the less likely the crew are to have a high happiness index score. So in order to develop further insight into this link between crew welfare and vessel condition, from May 2022, we have added a dedicated crew welfare section into our main checklist. At Idwell, our surveyors work with a rigid framework where they gather over 500 different data points on their inspection checklist whilst they are on board. Traditionally, this covers condition and management of the vessel, but we have now extended that to include crew welfare. 
This comprises of 12 questions that allow us to develop an objective assessment of the welfare conditions on board a vessel. A lot of thought and debate went into each question to ensure that each was practical in nature. By this, I mean any item we raise as a potential negative can be simply rectified by the vessel's owner or manager. For example, if there is no Wi-Fi system on installed on board, one can be installed. If a vessel has inadequate gym facilities, better equipment can be ordered and delivered to the vessel. It is also important to mention that these new questions allow us to better highlight vessels where crew welfare is to a high standard. The results of these questions will impact the vessel's overall idwell rate. This means that should a vessel have poor crew welfare, it will be highlighted in the report. I believe this increase in emphasis helps to further bring a vital issue to the forefront of every individu individual who reads one of our reports. And it is only as more and more people become aware of how important this issue is, that widespread and significant change can take place. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> so as you can see, seafarer happiness can have an impact on key aspects of shipping and not always in the most obvious of ways. Uh, hopefully our discussion this morning has given you some food for thought and I can already see that we've received quite a few questions. So we'll now move on to the questions and answers. Um, just a reminder, if you do have a question, then make sure you use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen and, <coughs> and we'll answer them. So moving on to the first question, and that is, um, will investing in crew welfare automatically improve the condition of a vessel? Um, Tom, would you like to answer that one? Of course, and this is a very good question. I think it's important to first highlight that when we state condition of a vessel, there is over 500 data points. So we crew welfare 100% has an impact on that, but there are various other points that have an uh, impact, such as condition of decks, condition of machinery, overhaul maintenance, condition of lube analysis, um, PMS condition, the list is almost endless. But I will say that with the introduction of these crew welfare questions, it allows us to get a better idea and look further into the link between condition, uh, vessel condition and crew welfare. Uh, thanks, Tom. Does anyone else have any comments they want to bring on that one? Yeah, I'll have a quick go at that. Uh, um, you know, change is often slow. So will instantly a happy crew translate into a good ship? I don't honestly know. We suspect it will. And looking at the data from Edwal and our own kind of thoughts on how important seafarers are, then yes. But I'd look at it slightly differently. If you've got a lot of unhappy, dissatisfied, fatigued, you know, world weary seafarers on board, your vessel could certainly get worse. So, you know, it's not always looking at the positive. There's a constant negative to all of this as well. So investing in crew, making sure that they have the best chance to do the job, to live well, to enjoy their career at sea is an important fundamental of this. Thank you. Robert, maybe just I add on to this. I, I, I echo the same comments as, as Tom and Stephen that um, <laughs> welfare is, is one of many aspects that, that influence the condition on board. Improving the welfare will maybe not necessarily immediately improve the condition, but it's definitely a contributing factor to it. Yeah, yeah no, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, on that, actually, uh, Keith, one of the questions we've had is, is there a correlation between unhappy crew uh, and safety and accidents? And have you uh, any specific examples that you, you can think to mind? I, I had a look at that in, in our claims actually, because I, I was expecting a question like that. It's really difficult to in our claims to find back those statistics. The way we categorize claims does not always indicate um, how well-being is, is is related to it. So we'll indicate this was a human uh, error, for example, or this was caused by inadequate following of procedures. Um, the causation then tends not to go far enough to be able mm -hmm. to say this was um, an unhappy crew that was distracted on the bridge, that was not paying attention, and that then... Um, collided with a fishing boat or something like that. So what we are seeing from our claim side is, yes, we are getting more mental illness related claims. That That is, that is a, a clear uh, indication from our claims. Um, most likely that will be as a result of COVID um, associated with the lack of, of uh, shore leave, et cetera. 
<clears throat> we suicides are an issue. It's not always that easy because it does not always get recorded as a suicide. It might become a missing at sea category, which is not the same. But that is an issue as well for seafarers. Um, and what we are seeing this year, particularly so far, is an increase in anxiety of crew and associated with that also repatriation of crew. Maybe they are trying to get home quicker because they want, don't want to stay on board and because they are having issues with crew change. So maybe anxiety is helping them with that um, or they really are having anxiety. I just can I just jump in there as well? I mean, <clears throat> there's the obvious human angle to all of this, and whether it's retention of seafarers, whether it's you know in in, in your own friendships, relationships, whatever. No one ever left a job because they were too happy, and so you know this is the reality that we're working. The human angle is so important and pivotal onto all of this. I, the, the issue of anxiety is really interesting. Um, I did have a look, just a very quick look at the data we've had for the quarter that's coming. And there does seem to be this sense of associated kind of things around anxiety. Um, and hearing that this is a wider issue, I had COVID myself a few months back. And one of the knock-on effects of that was I, I felt quite anxious afterwards. And I, so I don't know whether this is perhaps a, a long tail of COVID that is perhaps affecting people at sea as well. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to explore that more in the quarter that's coming, but it does seem to be something of a ticking time bomb that's in seafaring at the moment. Yeah, no, no that's, that's very true. Um, just to point, we are running a little bit tight on time now. There's still plenty of questions, as I mentioned, any questions that aren't answered will get answered afterwards. Um, so if you have got a question, you know, you do, do submit it. Um, I think we've got time just for one more. Um, and that is uh, that it's been highlighted a couple of times this morning that Wi-Fi access on board does improve uh, welfare. Uh, and also that that's been made mandatory for all seafarers. So the question here is, does that negate the need for it to be in the Edwall inspection reports at all, Tom? Absolutely not. Um, I think with any welfare issue, whether it's based at sea, based ashore, it's a constant evolution. And while it is excellent news to see that this will be pushed forward and it's going to be mandatory to have access on board, like Eve mentioned, there's no indication of how much it's going to cost and there's no indication of how effective that internet access will be. It's all well and good saying you have internet access, but if you can only access a WhatsApp message once a day in comparison to accessing social media, it's a very different environment. If you have to pay $25, $50 to access your 500 megabytes, suddenly seafarers are making a choice to send the money home or do they use it to contact home? And that isn't a choice that they should be making in the first place. It's vital we ask this and it's important to raise. We're not simply in, in, in the Edward checklist. We're not simply asking, does it have Wi-Fi? We're going further. We're asking the speed. Is it paid for? Is it free? <laughs> that granularity in the question allows us to get a better concept of what the general consensus is behind the Wi-Fi on board. Yeah. yeah, if I could just add as well, I think, you know, when seafarers talk about connectivity, it's not just in its broader sense, they talk about good quality, cost-effective connectivity. And, and as this becomes more of a compliance issue, then it's more important than ever that we're able to build this realistic picture of what the actual state of connectivity is on board and, and how the seafarers feel about it. So, uh, yeah, I think it's becoming even more of a key trigger issue. Yeah, no, that, that's uh, so true. Um, so, as I say, I think probably squeeze one more question in because there is quite a few that are coming in, struggling to keep up a little bit here. Um, so that is that, um, do the panel have any examples of where unhelpful and unpleasant interpersonal behaviours have been addressed as part of safety improvements? Um, this is in relation to well-being often being impacted by bullying and harassment and the impact that that can have on the uh, running of the vessel. Um, anyone want to answer that one? Um, over the course of the Ukraine-Russia conflict, the last quarter results definitely started to, to cover those difficult interrelationships on board more and more. 
um, stories of uh, a master and chief officer who would not communicate with each other. Um, the, the, the safety and also the show, social implications on board are obvious in that. You know, we a tight knit crew is pivotal to a good vessel. And if they're not able or willing to communicate with each other, then the safety implications, you know, are there and real. So that's a kind of ongoing live example, if you like, of the difficulties of, of social interaction on board. I think just to add on top of that, at my local airport welfare committee meeting, the last one I was at um, last month, this was an issue raised as well. And I was speaking to two of the chaplains who are on board vessels all throughout South Wales. And this was a very common theme, this mm-hmm. divide that has been developed between Russian and Ukrainian seafarers, so much so that they wouldn't be in the same room together. Mm-hmm. And if they can't be in the same room together, how are they supposed to communicate to safely navigate a ship from A to B? And I think this is something that, I, that I highlighted when I asked about what is the risk of not having appropriate welfare facilities or appropriate support on board. The risk here is that a ship grounds or it ends up in a fight and someone gets injured. Like we, I, it's a very volatile situation. And the, well, the chaplains I spoke to use the term ticking time bomb. Uh, mm. I, realistically, it's only going to get worse until something that is addressed properly. Yeah, and uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Robert. Let me just add on one point to this. Um, I know we're running over time, but um, I I think it is all the points mentioned are are really valid and important. But I I want to emphasize that we need to raise the awareness and we need to educate the shore side as well. If the shore side does not have the proper procedures in place to be able to deal with the bullying on board of ships, then on board nothing is going to change. If they are not putting proper procedures in place to when and where on board of ship Wi-Fi can be accessed, it will create problems. If we are we are seeing ships where, where the crew is going on board of the bridge while passing through Singapore Straits, just because they are having a better um, reception on the bridge. But that is distracting the navigators from doing their job. And those procedures should be clearly put in place. Another example of 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 the ben- so-called benefits of having really good communication uh, means on board is the operational department telephoning the captain h- half an hour after departure where is your departure message while the pilot is still on board and the, the ship hasn't even properly sailed yet mm-hmm. so i think there is there are a lot of this kind of examples where education of the shore side people is is important um, in addition to being able to provide those uh, means of communication on board. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good point. I think we've all experienced uh, the interference that can come from having a, a mobile phone on board um, and too much connection almost. Um, so I think, as I say, we are running over. There's so many questions, though. Um, I don't. We will answer those that if we don't answer in the panel. We will share them afterwards. But um, I think the last question then is... Um, with regards to crew fatigue, um, so sorry, he's asking, what are your views regarding crew fatigue as a result of having unlimited time connected to Wi-Fi and internet on board? Um, obviously, with people perhaps staying up longer than they should be between watches in order to communicate to home. Um, Tom, do you have a view on this one? I think this is an excellent question, and I think really it overlaps two issues. So fatigue on board vessels is nothing new, um, as both uh, other panelists, Eve and Stephen, have have raised. It's hard work being at sea and the number of tasks are increasing and it's constant and it's a high risk, high pressure environment. As we all know, if something goes wrong, more often than not, you'll end up on the news because it's a catastrophic event. That's always in the back of the mind of seafarers. So as they're working long hours, it's like fatigue is already an issue. But I don't think that it's fair or it's accurate to assume that if there was unlimited access, that it would only be used to uh, um, all the time. Seafarers are professionals. They do the job day in, day out. And the best example of that is over the pandemic. The boats kept coming back and forth. Food, energy, oil, clothes, everything came back and forth all throughout the world. It didn't stop when everything else did. So I think we can trust and them as adults and as responsible professionals that they are and give them this ability to contact home so after a hard day's work like anyone would have 
they have the ability to call their wife or their mother or their son, whoever they want to call and say, oh, I had a rough day. How was your day? And that can make the world of difference when you're alone. I think that's a good um, point. Sorry, sorry. go on, Stephen. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, certainly that comes across in the happiness index that people saying that having the ability to talk to home makes the difference to their lives. Um, I think also as well, we need to be careful that, you know, there's, there's a slight implication that one type of fatigue is better than another. It's okay if they're fatigued as long as they got knackered doing work, whereas if they're tired because they were playing silly beggars, then it's their own fault. You know, I think we have to understand that fatigue seafarers are fatigue seafarers, whatever the reason, and that needs to be dealt with. And I think echoing Tom's excellent point is, you know, if you will trust a person with a hundred million pound vessel, you should perhaps trust them with a mobile phone and Wi-Fi access. That's a good point, actually, Stephen. <laughs> I, I was just going to add, I think it, it really is important that seafarers are able to communicate with their family. I think that is that is good. But again, in order to improve the social cohesion on board, there needs to be a system or an opportunity on board if they are receiving bad news from their family. They need mm -hmm. to have the means of talking with somebody on board of the ship about it so that they are not going to stay in their cabin locked up and depressed um, about what is happening on board or going to continue calling all the time. And similarly, after educating the shoreside people, can I educate the families as well, please? Yeah. Um don't go and disturb seafarers on board just because the plumbing needs uh, changing in the bathroom mm -hmm. um, or because they don't know how to make a transfer to to somebody else on, on the bank. So so quite a number of companies are putting support in place actually for families that where the family can call that shoreline first to get mm -hmm. assistance with this kind of benign, simple things that should not get all the way to the seafarer on board i'm i'm really I'm, I'm in favor of having communication on board and with the family absolutely but i just feel that the the social part on board that cohesion is is really important to get it to get your crew happy on board and then the safety of the ship yeah yeah no that no some some good points i'm afraid i'm gonna have to shut the discussion down now though um and so we are coming towards the end of our time to get a run over a little bit, so I do apologise for that. Um, as I did mention, though, we will circulate an overview of all questions and answers. So if we didn't answer your questions this morning, and there are quite a few that we didn't get around to, I'm afraid, then uh, we will get back to you. So um, all that remains is for me to thank the panel for their valuable time and insights this morning. Uh, and I'd also like to thank you all for attending. Uh, we really do appreciate it. So please do take care, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.